told that you assassinated some previous speaker a couple of hundred years ago. That's, that's, that's quite a message to deliver to the speaker just before they come in. Uh, <laughs> you, um, you, uh, I thought I had some prepared remarks. <laughs> <laughs> That's a relief. <laughs> so, um, so I saw the list of people who've spoken beforehand, and I'm afraid that what I'm about to say might come across as the sort of deranged ramblings of a space cadet nerd. Um, but I just want to remind you that it'd be very rude if you left while I was actually. <laughs> uh, and I'd probably be better uh, during Q and A because it's nice to know at least one person's listening. Um, so I'll talk about a range of things that um, shape how I choose what I do um, and observations about just how other people choose what they do. Um, so, so some of you may know of, of Moore's Law, um, which is very important in the software industry because it basically is a license to write bad software because next year it will look like good software. Um, and you may also know Murphy's Law, um, which I think in its in its full statement says that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Murphy's Law is sort of the quantum mechanical sand in your mechanics. It basically means if a particle of sand can pop into existence <coughs> right where it will hurt most, then sooner or later when you're writing software it will. Um, and actually it's a very important, both of those are very, very important because um, uh, Murphy's Law teaches us to write software defensively uh, because really great software um, is software that deals gracefully with, with ungracious situations, with failures. Uh, there's also Shuttleworth's Law, um, which I wouldn't normally relate, but since you're all very, very bright, it might be useful. Shuttleworth's Law is that even very, very intelligent people occasionally will do very, very stupid things. Um, and you know, by observation, I know that this is true. <laughs> um, and that's kind of what I wanted to to talk about. I wanted to talk about the, the sort of pendulum of life, which essentially is an oscillation between um, intelligence and stupidity, but really it's an oscillation between greed and fear. Um, you see, in, in life, uh, uh, people get greedy, uh, and greed makes you stupid. So as people get greedier and greedier, they become more and more stupid. Um, and then, clearly, that leads to failure. Um, and then people experience a bit of fear. And fear makes you smart. Fear actually makes you intelligent. <laughs> fear makes you think carefully about the consequences of what you're going to do. And so you start to behave in a more intelligent fashion. Uh, and that makes you successful, at which point it's all too easy to become greedy. And <coughs> the cycle repeats itself again and again. So this pendulum between intelligence and stupidity is really a pendulum between greed and fear. So I think it's really important in life that we understand those two things very, very well, greed and fear. Um, because all of us will have to confront them and, and contain them or tame them or manage them. You'll never avoid them. None of us are immune, right? Even very intelligent people do, do very stupid things. Um, so the most important thing to know about greed, I think, uh, is not that it's ugly, because it is obviously ugly but that it will make you stupid. Um, and, and if you look in life at, at, at things that often go wrong, you know, people get swept up in ponds and schemes and lose their family savings, which is a tragedy. But if they hadn't been greedy, they might not have been carried away in that, in that, in that fashion. Um, we, see, we see the same thing happening again and again, right? Um, bubbles, asset price bubbles, are essentially fueled by greed, greed mixed with success. Uh, there are a few things more alarming or more dangerous, I think, than an economic good time. If you look here, if you look here at the good time that was had during the inflation of the property bubble and how that was driven, driven by greed, um, and the, the unwinding of that and the devastation and difficulty that causes, I think it could really have been avoided if, if people more sensible and savvy about um, how to contain and manage 
that very human instinct. Um, so I'm not one of the people who subscribes to the Gordon Gecko view of life, that greed is good. But I think there's another side that really is good, which is ambition. Um, and I think it's really important in life to be ambitious. You're all clearly highly qualified for life. Um, and I think you should give yourself permission to be really ambitious as to what you do with that. Um, uh, the distance between where you are now and the frontiers of human understanding is very, very short. In a very short period of time, you can get right to the cutting edge, right to the interesting parts. Uh, and you can start tearing up dogma, which is a really nice thing to do in life, right? There are these dogmas that get taught. We were talking about Homo economicus. What a clock! Uh, and yet it was being taught as fact just a short while ago. And only now people are sort of saying that that emperor has no clothes. So all around us will be surrounded by things that are taught as dogma, taught as absolutes, taught as limits. And yet the distance between where you are now and tearing up that dogma is very, very short. If you're ambitious, if you give yourself permission to uh, pursue what you think might be a better truth, you'll find very quickly the doors open up and you get there. So don't be greedy, but do be ambitious. Um, so that's greed. And then on the other side of the, the pendulum, we have, we have fear. Um, and the first thing I think you have to understand about fear is that there is no safe place. Um, there is no place where you can insulate yourself from the things that you might worry about. Um, so, for example, I remember interviewing people for, for jobs um, uh, a few years ago uh, who were also interviewing in Nokia. And what I am in love with at the moment is this totally crazy free software gig. It's a very bad idea to try and make money giving stuff away. But um, we're passionate about it. And we think, it, we think it's, there's some elements of it that feel like the future. We don't know how it all fits together, but we think there's something there. We don't figure out someone else will. So it's kind of fascinating. Um, but it is obviously not a secure place. And so this guy was saying, well, you know, I'm trying to choose between, between this gig that you're doing, which is fascinating, and this job in Nokia, which is a very safe company. Well, fast forward three years only, and the world looks like a very different place. Nokia is in desperate straits. Uh, because they didn't take any risks. Because they were filled with people who essentially thought they were going into a safety bubble. Uh, however you try and insulate yourself, really, however you try and insulate yourself from risk, life is a way of kind of reaching through and ripping your heart out. Right? It just does. And so, the first thing about fear is that you can't, you can't shy away from it. Right? All of the interesting things in life will be a little scary. They, they just will. And if you know that, then it's less scary. Fear will make you intelligent, right? If you, if you really respect the problem that you confront, you'll be smart about it. Um, uh, Robert Scott and Amundsen, read the book and look at, look, look at the different approaches that they took to the challenge of, of pushing back the frontiers of exploration to the poles. Uh, Scott feared unpopularity. He feared um, uh, he feared failure. He feared um, uh, society. Right? Amundsen feared the cold. And so the two of them took very different approaches to managing their risks. And, and the results, tragic as they were, speak very clearly about when you're setting out to do something, how, how carefully you should choo choose, how carefully you should choose what you're afraid of, where your risk is, and how you how you attack them and manage them. A fear can paralyze you, and you should never let you should never let that happen. Um, uh, I've done some crazy things, and the scariest time is always for me is always the time just before committing to do it. Like deciding to do it is much scarier than actually doing it. Um, uh, deciding to go to Russia and, and and commit to trying to become a kind of amateur cosmonaut, um, was much scarier than actually being in Russia. The actual decision to fly came about <coughs> two days before 
before the flight itself. We, we, we go through all of these processes, all of these checks and barriers, and eventually you end up you know, in Kazakhstan, in the quarantine facility, and fully certified as a member of this crew, the craft is on the fueling pad, you know, it's going to happen. And at that point, for the first time, it really is a true choice. And I remember being terrified, uh, really distressed. I went and uh, the place was devastated, you know, Kazakhstan, the, the, the Russian space program had crumbled. So I ended up climbing down into an old pool that had no water in it and sitting and trying to talk myself through this. And my, my phone rang, it was my personal line, South African number, and I thought, ah, oh, that's the universe, it's a family member calling to talk me through this difficult decision. And it was the wrong number. <laughs> but it got me, you know, out of my head. And the thing is that, yeah, the scariest time of the whole experience was the decision to commit. Uh, I might be a bit weird because when my girlfriend and I go on roller coasters, I spend the entire time in the queue shit scared. And she's fine. And then when we're on the roller coaster, she's screaming her heart out, and I'm fine. So maybe this doesn't apply to everybody. But, uh, but for me, the anticipation is far worse than the actual action. Um, the thing you should never fear, or never be paralyzed by, is fear of failure. Um, because we just don't know what the future looks like. And you will regret trying if you don't try something that you're really excited about. Uh, a failure takes all sorts of, you know, can come through faults of your own or through no fault of your own. Um, and so don't worry about it. Um, and perhaps the most deep-seated fear, the one that you should never give into, is fear of, of loneliness or unpopularity. If you're going to do something really interesting in life, people that you trust, people that you care about, people who you respect, will not necessarily understand, will not necessarily agree. And that's been true of everybody that I admire. They had people that they really cared about who told them they were crazy, they were wrong. Uh, uh, there was some long list of reasons why they shouldn't do what, what they went on to do. Um, and if they'd listened, then history would be different. So, so give yourself permission to go and take those risks. So then the last thing I wanted to ramble on a bit about is time. Um, because time is the only thing in life that's fairly doled out. Right? Everything else in life is uneven. Some people are taller, some people are shorter, some people are skinnier, some people are blonder. It wasn't, everything else is kind of uneven, but time is perfectly evenly doled out. Right? You have 24 hours today. Bill Gates is 24 hours today. You have one year to be 25. Everybody else, hopefully, gets one year to be 25. You get one decade to be in your 50s. Everybody else gets one decade to be in their 50s. So it's really a question. The only fair thing is what you do with it. And I think it's really important to be conscious of that. Um, the other thing that's important to be conscious of is um, uh, that your experience of an experience is totally different at different times. So if you want, there are five things you want to do in your life. Say, write a book, start a business, go traveling, whatever. Write some poetry, whatever. Your experience of that thing will be totally different as a 20-year-old, or as a 30-year-old, or as a 60-year-old. You know, if you're a 60-year-old, go traveling, you do it differently to if you're a 20-year-old. And so you kind of need to choose what the big things in life are. Do you know the story about the rocks getting in the jar? I don't know if this is old hat. He's a teacher, scientist, and he has a jar on his, on his table, and he says to his students, um, How many, how, many, how, many, how many rocks can you get in the, the jar? And they take a bunch of rocks and stick them in the jar. And he says, is the jar full? And they say, yes, it's full. And he takes some sand and he can get some more sand in. And then, is it full? Yes, it's full. And he takes some water and he can get some more water in. So now he's got a full jar. Uh, and then he says, right, take it all out. So he pours the water out, takes the sand out, puts the rocks in. And he says, now put the sand in first. So put the sand in. Now put the rocks in. It becomes impossible, obviously, to put the same number of rocks in the jar. And the moral is, in life, get the rocks in first. Like, choose the big things that you want to do, whatever they may be, and get those things done first. Because all the other stuff you can fit in around it, and people fit amazing stuff around greatness. 
if you don't know what the things are that you want to get in that jar, then you'll fill it with sort of arbitrary stuff. So time and being conscious of time for me is a really big deal. And one last thought about time. Um, so, and I don't know who told me this. Someone said you should, when you meet a person, you should see them as all ages. So, not an 18 year old, not a 60 year old, but as all of those ages at once. You know, if you think of the f time as the fourth dimension, if you could turn the universe around and sort of look down time, and you could compress somebody down into just themselves of all ages at one time, then that's very interesting because then you really know who they are. So, the, the thing to think about, I think, is uh, for you, don't think of yourself necessarily as being as you are now. And when you meet someone of a very different age, don't think of them as they are now. Think of yourself as being of all ages. And ask, like, what's going to be true? What stories will be true of you um, throughout all of those times? Because that's the bit that really, really matters. That's all. very real. Um, uh, we, our own kind of learning is just pattern matching, right? Uh, every time in life, in history, we've thought that we were somehow special, you know, center of the solar system, center of the universe, blah, blah, blah. It's always wrong. Yeah. And one of the things that we think is special about us is intelligence. Uh, and it's not. It's just pattern matching, right? Um, uh, people who appear to be really, really smart um, have just spent more time thinking about the patterns that, that they can connect up. Um, and if there's an exception to that, I think it's, it's this wonderful thing that you get when you have people who um, are gifted in two very different, or have studied two very different things, because they're able to see patterns that other people who just studied one thing will never see. But ultimately, it is just pattern matching. So, so I have no doubt that you know, what we see today is machine learning, Google doing very good search, will ultimately turn into machines we talk to. Um, and that is going to bring about one of the most interesting economic transitions in the future that the, we will ever have seen in history because suddenly it won't make sense to pay anybody to do anything. Because why would you? When for a fraction of the price you could have something much smarter that can do everything that we can do. So I don't know how that's going to work. It's really interesting. Um, but I absolutely think it will happen. That's cool. Um, well, I'll just, I guess on a totally unrelated, unrelated note, um, this, this Marshall Earth Foundation, what sort of projects do you try? Like, what are you interested in supporting? What do you look for when, what is it about something that makes you want to invest and fund that? Uh, so, so we started out where it was, like I thought I had some great ideas. If I could just find people to do those great ideas and that would work. It was a total disaster. Either the ideas would crash or I couldn't muster the right people. So then we flipped it around. And, and essentially what we do now is say, we want to find people who are passionate about an idea. Their own idea, not my idea, their own idea. It has to be an idea that is kind of at that cusp of change. I think change, change never happens in isolation, right? There's always some things changing here and some things changing there, and then somebody connects them and the magic happens, right? And, and so we try and find people, typically they, they, they might have, they might have uh, just finished an undergraduate degree, they might have finished a postgraduate degree, and they're in that intersection where they're still powerfully attached to their ideas. They haven't gotten sucked into you know, the humdrum story of life. Um, but they don't yet have the platform to artic you know, they're not a professor of something, they don't have tenure anywhere, they don't, they're not like, super recognized, they don't get asked to speak at conferences. And so we give them an adrenaline shot essentially. We say, okay, we'll pay a salary for a year, and then <coughs> any money that you take out of your pocket, out of that salary, and put into your idea, we'll multiply tenfold. So it's an interesting thing, because it actually costs them to, to do, but then they get this big adrenaline shot, right, this acceleration. And that's worked much better. Um, and so of the range of fellows, with the general theme is change and openness, but we've got some really interesting fellows. Some guys have done stuff around telecommunications. So looking at how, how um, you can dramatically lower the cost of telecommunications by getting rid of a lot of the sort of fixed line 
stuff and making it much more organic. You, know, you, you create a telecommunications fabric just by having um, pebbles that talk to each other and, and create a fabric over which communication can happen. And then once you have that, you know, anyone can run a phone system. The phone system is just, you know, everything is essentially Skype these days, right? So, so anyone can become a telco operator. So one fellow has done that. Another fellow is big into kind of, um, he describes it in a weird way. If you had to reboot society, imagine we just we lost all manufacturing capacity and you had, to, you had to rebuild from scratch, what would you need? And he figures that there are 50 machines, 50 things that we need to be able to create. And once you've got those, you can start creating everything else. I think 50 is totally arbitrary, but it's interesting. So, so he's essentially doing open source designs for all of those things. And then he's got a whole bunch of people to come and essentially run that experiment. You know, can, they, can they make those things and then how do they get on? So they're essentially beta testing that reboot of society. It's totally malarkey, but I think it's very interesting. <laughs> um, uh, there's a guy who pioneered the idea of open source textbooks. Um, and he's now gone on to get a couple of governments to buy into the idea. And so they're starting to essentially um, uh, embrace and promote these open source textbooks, which I think is very, very interesting. Um, so those are some of the ones that have, that have thrived. Um, at this point, is there anybody in the audience who'd like to ask a question to Mark? Uh, up until this point, space is kind of, with the exception of people like yourself, space is kind of a preserved for government agencies. Do you ever see a time like when space would be pretty much open for everybody? And if so, like, how soon do you think it's going to be? Yeah, we're right on the cusp of that now. Um, and there may be fits and starts, you know. If, 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 if space tourism launch number five blows up and kills everyone on board, then we'll be set back five years or ten years. But essentially, we're right at the cusp of it. And the, the key problem, the key problem in terms of our manned exploration of space has been economics. There's, there's no way to make money out there. And so it becomes a question of pride, or it's one of those things that we should do. And, and that's really hard to sustain. Um, uh, but as we flip into things that people want, like tourism, uh, experiential, we'll, we'll start to essentially create an industry that professionalizes it. Uh, I love many of the astronauts, cosmonauts that I got to know, uh, but there, there are real limits to our ability to explore if you say that that is the only model that you, that you would tolerate. What we'll see with space tourism is, you know, for the first couple of flights will be two minutes in space, and then there'll be five minutes in space, and then there'll be 25 minutes in space. Once they get to 35 minutes in space, you could pretty much be crossing the Atlantic, right? So then suddenly this becomes not just space tourism, but it becomes space commuting. Uh, and so we'll build, we'll build uh, an industry. And then for NASA and ESA and others, they'll find that instead of having to spend millions of dollars to decide whether a laptop can work in space, they can just stick it on a tourist flight, and if it keeps working, then, then they know. When, when I flew, um, I wanted to take a couple of laptops up, and they said, well, you, you can't. We said, I said, why? They said, well, we don't have any laptops. I said, well, I'm sure I can get a laptop. <laughs> they said, no. They said that we bought all of them. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, we know that these laptops work, but they don't make them anymore, and we bought them all. And, and we, we rationing them, because we just keep sending those laptops, because they work. So I said, I'll tell you what, I'll take some new laptops, and if they work, thumbs up. And if they don't, well, hey. And they work perfectly fine, so the next shuttle flight from the space station, the next shuttle flight from the space station had a bunch of brand new laptops that were exactly the same as the ones that I take. So, that's the sort of weirdness of, of the government approach to space. And, and there's reasons for that, because when people die on a government program, it stops, right? Because it's funded by votes. So total paralysis. If a Boeing crashes, we don't shut down all air, you know, air flight. So the fact that it's done as this national flag, pride, we should do a thing, means that it's very vulnerable. So people don't take risks and, you know, fear, greed. To ask a very general question, Mark, what was your experience with space like? Brilliant. It was like a camping trip with a bunch of space nerds. <laughs> it, was, it was fantastic. Um, but the whole thing was kind of bigger than the trip in space. The whole thing, like, how many of you have lived in another country? Like, immerse yourself in a totally weird culture. Every other culture is weird. Yeah? And what do you think? Oh, me? 
But it's great, isn't it? Yeah. It really it changes you in, in interesting ways. I think everybody should do it. Go and live somewhere totally different. And if you want to pick somewhere totally different, Russia is spectacularly different. <laughs> yeah. I love Russia. Um, Russian, the lang a language really tells you, really, I think our brains are shaped by the languages that we speak. And Russian is like, is like a bunch of um, rugby players doing ballet, right? It's really harsh and guttural and brutal, but then it has these little fiddly, sort of delicate bits that pirouette. And the combination of those is exactly Russian psychology, right? It's really pretty brutal, but very elegant and nicely, you know, you know they'll, they'll find sophisticated harmonies and interesting things. And so that was really, really interesting. Anybody can do that, and I, I would recommend that you do it. Um, so the whole experience was much bigger than you know, being in space. Being in space is brilliant. I would love to go back. Someday. Is there another question? Could you sacrifice your path to becoming a cosmonaut? Like how you, yeah, how you came up? Yeah, I got really lucky in the dot-com bubble. So, for all me ranting about greed and bubbles and things, if there's a bubble, ride it and get out. <laughs> and then go to space. So I got really lucky. <laughs> I got really lucky. There's no, there's no other way. And then I was in this kind of interesting position. I was basically unemployed, but gainfully unemployed. And again, this thing about time being really important. Your experience of going to space would be totally different as a 25-year-old. I was 26 when I decided to go, 27 when I flew. It makes me the third youngest person ever to have flown. So basically, you're a puppy, you know what I mean? Like, you go to space, everything's exciting. And um, so I had a very different experience of it to... to professional astronauts who today are always in their 40s or 50s. Um, um, again, time being important. It was a particular time in Russia's history. They were going through this traumatic transition. Um, the space industry, which been one of those things that we should do, you know, was completely cut. So you had, you had thousands of people who's, who'd spent decades, essentially, pursuing this, this national obsession of space, were suddenly not getting paid at all. And, and that's why I felt there was some, there was some, it was almost important, in a sense, to, have, to, to keep that industry alive. And many of the people that I worked with every day would literally only get paid at the end of that month and, and pay $200 as a wage or $100 as a monthly wage because I was there. You know, it was an extraordinary kind of time and feeling. And they were amazing, amazing people. Some of my instructors um, had known Yuri Gagarin. Gagarin's wife, uh, Valentina worked in Star City, you know. So it was this surreal um, experience, really kind of interesting experience, at, and the right time of life for me to do it, and the right time in history for it to be possible to be done. And was there any more questions from the audience? And do you think that space org is a valid way that space agencies could have formed space org? Well, I think what they'll do is they'll end up dramatically reducing their costs for the basic stuff, you know. Certifying a toilet in space would cost millions of dollars <coughs> if you do it the way they currently do it. But once Richard Branson has a 25-minute flight across the Atlantic, someone's going to need to go to the bathroom, right? And so they'll make a toilet, and then it'll work, or it won't, and then they'll make a better one, and it'll work, or it won't. And then NASA has a free toilet that they can take to space. Right? So, so <coughs> if you think of the costs of, of putting people on Mars, that's not going to happen through space tourism initially. Uh, but the cost there for the government agencies would be greatly reduced if they have tourism happening in low Earth orbit or suborbital. So it's essentially these things will play off, the, off each other. There's absolutely a role for, for agency-led space. Right? Some of the science will never happen unless it's done. Are an agency by, me, by the agencies. Some of the missions will never happen unless they're done by agencies. Um, but the cost of those and what's possible will expand. Sorry, the cost will reduce and what's possible will expand by having a sustainable industry underneath it. And, and I think that's real. And I think it's grand that a lot of my old buddies from Star City are going to become pilots in space, which is what they always really wanted to do. You know, touring around, giving lectures at schools, is asking questions about how you go to the toilet in space is limited. But they want to fly. And so space tourism, I think, is going to give a lot of them um, 
a real, the real opportunity to fly in space every day, which is grand for them. And just to mark, um, I think a lot of students sort of in, in Trinity would kind of um, like maybe perhaps consider an entrepreneurial route, but there's kind of a lot of security in just going into a large company like straight out of college. Would you have any advice for people to say in that predicament, or do you think is there something to be said for perhaps initially going into a large company, then following your entrepreneurial ventures afterwards, or should people just go straight for it? Why don't you listen? <laughs> <laughs> so, greed and fear, ambition and fear. Right? It's exactly what you're asking. Right? Should I take the safe option? <coughs> What's the safe option? Which big company is going to provide you that safe option? AIB? <laughs> Nokia? Google? Apple? There's no safe option. They all come and go. Right? And what's your most precious asset? Time. Right? You have the least to lose now. So in some senses, it's the best time to be entrepreneurial. You have the least to lose. What do you spend in a month? Bugger all, right? Your living costs are nothing. So as an entrepreneur, you've got the longest runway with whatever money you can cobble together now, and you will have. The, the guys I really admire, the guys who are 45 with a mortgage, you know, take out a mortgage to start a business. That's terrifying and horrible. But, you know, you have no preconceived ideas about how it can't be done. You have very low living expenses. You can get by, right? or pizza and Coca-Cola. <laughs> I did. And so you, you've got much more room to get stuff wrong and then fix it and make it right. And so it's a great time to be an entrepreneur when you graduate. Now, not everybody will do it. Not everyone will pull it off. You know, if you try, who knows how it will work out. Most don't succeed the first time or the first couple of times. But you learn so much, right? It's amazing when you go into a large organization where people have only worked in little large organizations, they only know one thing. So you'll sit down in a meeting with them and they're like stuck gramophones. They'll be, yes, but about the legal. Yes, but about the legal. Yes, but about the legal. You're an entrepreneur when you're young. You learn a bit of everything. You learn about art, right? You learn about marketing, which is basically just telling you a story. You learn about economics, accounting. You learn what you have to learn. So it's a much better time to, to start. I mean, look at, look at, Look at the great guys, look at Branson and others, right? They started early. And I, I would encourage you if, you, if you actually think you want to do it, just do it. Give yourself permission. Just go. Yeah. There's another guy who just decided to go and live on a small island somewhere close to his 40s. And his name is uh, Arthur C. Clarke. So I was wondering uh, what's the path there? He had some other issues. I mean, apart from being brilliant. Um, but ultimately, like I said, the worst thing that you should fear, the thing you shouldn't fear, is the scorn of others. Right? If you're really interested in something, and there's not, there's not anybody else around you that's interested in that thing, why stick around? I don't know the story of why you went to Sri Lanka, didn't you? So I don't know the story of the motivations, things, but I suspect he just felt that that was how he wanted to spend a decade or two decades. And I think all the great people in life have done things that other people didn't understand. Right? Maybe that was part of it for him. So I'm not entirely sure what your question is. No, but I read that you live on the island of Oh, yeah. That's a great question. Oh, oh, oh. Did Arthur C. Clarke live on the Isle of Man? No, but... <laughs> Sri Lanka? <laughs> the Isle of Man? <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of, those, one of those improv comedy situations where they just throw words at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll tell you the story about the Isle of Man for me. Did I tell you this earlier? And I'm not sure. <laughs> 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 That's all right. Why are you the president of this? <laughs> So, so <laughs> when, I, when I finished university, okay, here's the whole story. When I finished university, as I was going through university, oh, so the whole story, I went to a school that has a Rhodes Scholarship. Do you know what a Rhodes Scholarship is? 
I went to a school that has a Rotor Road Scholarship. Now, there are some countries that have Road Scholarship. Very lucky to get one of those. But I went to a small school that has a Road Scholarship. I was pretty damn sure I was going to get it, right? Uh, so I didn't really make much in the way of plans. When I was at university, I was kind of fascinated by the internet thing. And, uh, but my plan was I was going to get the Road Scholarship and go to Oxford, obviously. Um, and then I didn't. Uh, that really screwed my head. Um, but I'd spent the last two years at university getting fascinated by this internet thing. Anyway, I was too sort of embarrassed to go looking for a job because I hadn't really planned for that. So I thought what I would do is I would, I would just think about everything that I understood about the internet and, and find an entrepreneurial opportunity out of that. This is not a great position of strength to be playing from, right? My parents weren't necessarily entirely supportive of me sitting in the garage in my underwear all day long on the internet. <laughs> um, once my mom said, Sh shouldn't you think about getting a job? I was basically just burning through money that I'd saved up, and occasionally I would run a course teaching how the internet worked to people who wanted to know how the internet worked. Anyway, the thing that fascinated me was um, I was convinced that the internet was going to become a vehicle for commerce. I wasn't actually in my underwear all the time, it wasn't that bad. But, um, I was convinced that the internet had become a vehicle for commerce, and for that to happen, people had to be able to talk to each other securely. And I was very interested in cryptography that would make that possible. Uh, and the, the other thing that I was very conscious of is that the internet at the time was about bandwidth. Right? All, of the, all of the big businesses were getting set up were very dependent on bandwidth. Yahoo right, had to have big fat pumps. The Cape Town was not a great place to start a business that needed a lot of bandwidth in 1996. So I was trying to find something that I could do that would be important in the future, but that wouldn't require a lot of bandwidth. And it turned out that crypto and digital certificates were, were, the, were the way to do that. But I couldn't get into digital certificates. Digital certificates are about basically identity, trust. When you go to a website, you have a padlock. It's because someone has said to your browser that they think that this person is the right person to be running that domain. Basically, that's what happened. So I had to convince Netscape, which was the big company, a big browser at the time, and Microsoft, that I, kid in the garage in Cape Town, was the right person to be deciding that that was in fact Amazon.com. And that's a ludicrous proposition. But at the time, the US had some really stupid laws about cryptography that stopped American companies from exporting cryptography. What was stupid about that was there was already quite a lot of open source software that did all of that cryptography that was already, shock horror, outside of America. So basically, they were just stopping American companies from competing. So I went into the cryptography business and, and made up a web server that did cryptography. But what I really wanted to do was digital certificates. Uh, then an American company that was selling also web servers but couldn't sell them outside said um, that they would, essentially, they would essentially take over my external crypto web server business and, and said that they would bundle with their web servers one of my certificates, but no one would trust my certificates. And some guy at Microsoft just randomly decided that he needed to do everything that somebody else had done, which involved trusting my certificates. So, in a very short period of time, suddenly, I was a guy deciding if you should trust websites in the world. <laughs> this was deeply unexpected. Um, um, and then I, so, so that's how I got into the certificate business. One of the very first companies that bought a certificate from me, certificates have a country code in them, and it had a country code IM. So at the time, I had to learn quite a lot about geography because I had to, I had to go and find out where this country, the Isle of Man, was. Um, and I thought it was kind of fascinating that there was a whole country in the Irish Sea. Uh, you learn something every day. Anyway, a couple of years later, um, turns out the digital certificates were really strategic for the internet. And in the, at the top of the bubble, we got bought. Um, and so I ended up um, doing a lot of global investing. And the bank that I was working with said, um, uh, you know, where do you want to essentially set up the operation, the investment operation? You can do it in you know, all of these, these long list of places. That, but one of those places was the Isle of Man. So I thought, oh, what the hell? I remember that story, the Isle of Man. So I set up the structures there. What I didn't realize is that meant that every quarter I'd have to go for board meetings. So I suddenly find myself going to the Isle of Man every three months. <laughs> This is a very long, weird story, isn't it? <laughs> so then I moved to London and did 10 years in London, which is enough. And so I wanted to move to the country. And 
I thought of all the places that I go to regularly, I actually quite like the Isle of Man. So, be very careful what you start in the garage, or you end up living in the Isle of Man. <laughs> it's perfectly logical how that all happens. Actually, I should tell that story earlier. <laughs> What's the biggest failure you've had? Oh. Uh, shit, I've had lots of failures. I didn't get the Rhodes Scholarship. That worked out okay. I... I'm... I find it very difficult to judge what's not possible. Um, and sometimes that's great because it's a trial. Um, but oftentimes, that means you'll fail, right? Um, I'm not really good at answering this question. Um, I think it's likely that my greatest failure is still in the future. That's probably the only thing I can say with certainty. Because it's a bit like snowboarding, right? Once you get into snowboarding, really get into it. You start wanting to snowboard steeper and deeper, steeper and deeper. And it doesn't end well, right? But I think in life, if like me, you're driven to kind of find out what's possible, you will push yourself to the point where you fail. And so, in a sense, I suspect that my greatest failure is still in the future. Do you look forward to that? No. <laughs> I hate failure. Um, and, and one of the, one of the challenges of being like in my position, is that often the decision to fail is a decision, not a reality. Not a, so for example, we have this, this free software model. I've been giving software away for 10 years. When am I going to just give up and fail? That's a weird question to ask, right? Most people try something and then failure is thrust upon them, right? You run out of oxygen, you run out of airspace, you run out of air, you run out of bank course, doesn't matter, but it's time. If you get really lucky like me, you have to essentially decide what you want to do, but then you also have to decide when to stop. And that's really challenging. I kind of still think that there's interesting stuff on the free software front. Uh, otherwise, I actually wouldn't be doing it. But it is very challenging when you have to choose uh, to stop. Right? I found that very difficult with, with the non-profit stuff that I did. You know, you, 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 there's a cause, and it's an important cause. And so you try to support the cause. And it's hard to know when to start, like how much, you know what I mean? Like when do you say, okay, that, we're not going to win that one. Um, I think you just learn to do it. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Bitcoin? Bitcoin. Yeah. This cryptography. Sure, I know Bitcoin. It's very um, If we can get it all to work, I think it'd be really important. I mean, there's something broken about money, right? Money as we do it today is basically, there's something broken about it. So I think that means obviously there's room to, to figure something better. And the Bitcoin approach, uh, which essentially says, let's find some mathematical gold. What was great about gold? Gold was rare. It was hard to get and therefore it had value. You know, we could as as ascribe some value to it. You can't actually do anything with it really, but, but we ascribe value to it. So the Bitcoin story essentially says, can we do that mathematically? And that's interesting because it's a bit fairer than gold, right? It always struck me as weird that South Africa had tons of gold and it was richer than other countries. Um, so, so I think there's some really interesting things in it, both in terms of the impact on society if we could come up with a better kind of money, and the fairness of it, the idea that it might be a, a fairer way of doing things. But clearly they haven't taken over the world yet, um, so maybe they haven't sort of fully cracked it. But there's something interesting there. Um, I have a bunch of computers in my garage that I keep thinking I should hook up to mine bit bitcoins. <laughs> and Mark, I'm just interested, you, you studied IT and finance in Cape Town. Do you think, did, did it really help you much at all in what you went on to do? Or did, do you think that, yes, yeah. that's just very much went along as an entrepreneur? So it's unusual in that I took two different honours courses at the same time. I got kicked out of IT, um, but the idea was to take these two things and connect them. And in life, I think the people who study um, 
very divergent things, always are more interesting people. So if you can, if you can study, say, art and engineering, do. Or if you can study mathematics and language, do. Because you'll end up having insights that most artists or mathematicians or linguists or engineers wouldn't have, right? Because you're able to combine and synthesize things. So I think ultimately um, it was really useful to have studied both of those things. I never actually used finance, um, but I knew enough not to trust the bank. Um, and that was really useful. Uh, you will almost certainly not end up being what you study to be. I mean, that, I think, is just true of the vast majority of people. So, so all I would say is, whatever you do, be, find the interesting things and pursue those. I guess we'll just have time for one final question. This one, yeah. um, when you were talking about making the space industry, uh, not making the Bible, um, there's all this talk of mining space, moon bases, mining asteroids. Is that completely ridiculous? Or what do you is, think? It, is, it ridiculous or is, it, is it realistic? What do you think? I think it's... Well, in our lifetime, I can't see it happening, but a lot has happened. Well, you're making a bold call there. You're making a bold call about what's possible in your lifetime. Yeah. But you agree that if there's stuff here that has value and there's need here, that it's purely a question of connecting the dots. Yeah, but what, I mean, the stuff that's out there on the moon, I mean, to transport the toilet back and stuff, we're going to need a hell of a lot of need. And there's people investing in that. And the most interesting stuff that's on the moon is helium. I'm sorry. Is it helium 3? Yeah. yeah, helium 3. Which is our best guess, the best fuel for fusion. But there doesn't, there isn't a lot of helium on Earth because it escapes. It's one of the few things that will actually rise to the top of the atmosphere and escape. <coughs> so, if you think about energy as a serious issue, and you think fusion is a likely um, uh, resolution to that, then you would then you would say that we will be mining moon for helium three. Um, so I think it's absolutely natural. I think the question is about as weird as saying, should somebody sail across the Atlantic to go and find gold in South America, right? Before somebody does it, it makes no sense whatsoever. It's lunacy. And after someone does it, it's obvious. And judging the time scales is above my pay grade. But, yeah. And so I'd just like to thank Mark on behalf of the society for coming here today and um, for giving his address and asking a lot of questions. Um, and especially, uh, we're very proud to have you as an uh, as an patient of society. Uh, so I think Roz will escort you back to the council and we just have a final uh, thank you uh, to Mark for coming here today.